The problem with quantum effects is that the better you understand them, the more you sound like you're losing your mind. You can't just, you know, pick up a magnifying glass and show your buddy the whole quantum world. For many years, we were safe from the quantum nonsense as long as we stayed in our hot, wet, and noisy macroscopic world. But this has all changed recently with the discoveries of some nosy scientists that prove quantum demons have invaded our precious macroscopic life. The scariest thing about this quantum world is that we can understand it without believing it. For example, we believe a cat is either alive or dead, but we know that sometimes it is both at the same time, thanks to our friend Schrodinger. It's not right that Schrodinger was co-opting John Lennon's sense of fashion though, especially because it was before Lennon was even born. It only gets weirder from here. A good way to look at superposition is like how Lewis Lane always sees either Superman or Clark Kent, but when he's alone, he doesn't really know who he is, and maybe he wishes he were Kanye West. These superparticles can move through walls, and it's only by seeing them as perturbations in a continuous field that we can explain how they got there. And somehow one particle can be entangled with another particle, such that no matter how far apart they are, if we see what is happening with one, we know what's going on with the other. Kinda like Kimye or Brangelina. A pair of these entangled electrons results when blue light photons hit the eye of the European robin. Probably the English robin too, but he's non-migratory. But then of course, uh, African swallows are non-migratory. Oh yeah. So they couldn't bring a coconut back anyway. Wait a minute! Supposing two swallows carried it together! The European robin can migrate using magnetic fields, and the best theory we've got says that he uses a protein called cryptochrome in his eyes to see the inclination of the Earth's field lines. The lines incline upwards from the horizon as he heads south, and below the horizon as he heads north. At the North Pole, they point straight down into the Earth, but he's smart enough not to fly that far. I can't do experiments on robins, but fortunately cryptochrome is also found in plants. They don't use it for migration. Instead, they need it to tell them if they are in the dark, or if the sun is too bright and might give them a sunburn. Cryptochrome stops hypocaudal elongation in the presence of blue light, as I showed in a greenhouse experiment with radishes illuminated with blue, red, or green LEDs. My data showed that plants under red or green light grow taller per unit of mass than those grown under blue light only. The plants think they are shaded and so they are programmed to grow quickly upward until they find the blue light. If they get too much blue light, which can burn them, they use a signal from cryptochrome to start producing a kind of purple sunscreen called anthocyanin. Anthocyanins are antioxidants that protect the plant from solar damage. This is an example of a Thai basil plant growing among Italian basil plants. In Thailand, the Italian basil would sunburn, but in northern climates, the purple Thai basil grows more slowly. Red cabbage grows well in summer in our area, while winter cabbages are mostly green. Anthocyanins are all the rage now in healthier vegetables, like the trend towards darker tomatoes, with even more antioxidants due to copious amounts of anthocyanins. Even kale gets healthier with anthocyanins. All these fruits and veggies were grown in our yard or our greenhouse. So I bet you're wondering if vegetables can detect magnetic fields like robins. In fact, a wonderful study done with Dale Cress showed magnetic fields do significantly affect both monocotyl elongation and anthocyanin levels. I want to try this in our greenhouse, but you need a really large Helmholtz coil. Maybe next year. It really is amazing that quantum mechanics plays a significant role in magnetoreception, but it's even more important that the primary light energy gathering structures in photosynthesis are now thought to take advantage of a form of quantum field movement similar to quantum tunneling, to move from the receptor protein complexes to reaction center via all possible paths at once. It is as though they can decide retrospectively to arrive at the reaction center via the path that yields the best efficiency after trying them all first. Somehow the quantum coherence is maintained even though the condition in the plant leaf are vastly warmer, wetter, and more complicated than those effects can tolerate in the laboratory.
quantum biology was a field suggested by the founders of quantum mechanics, but nearly a hundred years later we are just beginning to understand its implications and mechanisms. It's nice to know that you can make observations and even contribute to the most complex and confusing physics ever presented with a shovel, some dirt, and seeds. After all, maybe, one is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth.